Мы очень рады сегодня, а, приступая к очередной четвергой конференции нашей, которая носит очень необычный формат, а, такой а, редкий гость у нас сегодня, очень достойный человек. Я хотел бы сделать некоторые приветствия, безусловно. У нас сегодня в гостях Джеймс Дик, это один из лидеров мировых а, в области изучения полинейропатии. Человек, возглавляющий специализированную крупную лабораторию в одном из крупнейших неврологических центров мира, клиники Майо в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Джеймс Дик был одним из инициаторов начала регулярных конференций в нашей стране от российско-американских Nexus Medicus, которые так проводятся по инициативе Ульяновского государственного медицинского университета, является совместной программой Ульяновского университета, нашего центра клиники Майо. Мы очень ценим этот формат взаимодействия, который удалось реализовать. Он привлекает много внимания, он э, привлекает возможность обмена не только опытом, но и э, обмена молодыми неврологами, возможности учиться в клинике Мюэ, так, как это уже было реализовано для некоторых наших молодых сотрудников. Это очень важно, безусловно, для нас. Ну и вообще всегда возможность пообщаться с ведущими специалистами в такой области неврологии, э, в смежных областях медицинских наук, что тоже бывает здесь, это знак нашей аудитории. Это очень дорого стоит, безусловно. И поэтому сегодня я надеюсь, что та лекция, которую он представит сегодня, она посвящена рефрактарной хронической воспалительной демонизирующей полинерпатии ХВДП и ХВДП подобным состоянием. Она вызовет не только интерес, но и желание задать некоторое количество вопросов. Лекция очень большая, не могу обещать, что вопросов будет много, возможно, задавать, но тем не менее, какое-то обсуждение, возможность поделиться собственным мнением и впечатлением об этих пациентах, об этой проблеме. Мы это очень Безусловно. Dear Mr. Dick, welcome to the Research Center of Neurology, the biggest institutions in uh, clinical and basic neurology in our country. It's my pleasure to uh, present you to our colleagues to announce your lecture devoted to CIDP. And we know uh, the world leader in this field of neurology. And we very much appreciate your contribution to our Nexus Medicus program in Uyansk, which is a new format of international conferences to us. And uh, we hope your presentation today will enhance the willingness, the intention of our young neurologists to work in this field of neurology and to help us to launch some new programs, maybe to establish some collaboration within our institutions. Thank you very much again for coming, and you may proceed. Thank you all very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, so we're going to talk about refractory CIDP, lookalikes, evaluation, and treatment. And where did I just do myself? All right. So the objectives are to discuss clinical features of classical CIDP, to discuss the different variants of CIDP, to discuss treatments, and discuss other types of neuropathies that look like CIDP and how to identify those neuropathies. When talking about inflammatory neuropathies, we should discuss what we know already. There's only a small number of drugs that are well studied. These include IVIG, plasma exchange, corticosteroids, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide. There are newer treatments that are less well studied, rituximab, interferon, tumor necrosis factor, alpha antagonist, and a autologous stem cell transplant. And when thinking about inflammatory neuropathies, we have to think about how do we know when a treatment is effective? How do we know when it works? Self-reporting from patients isn't enough. We need objective measures to know whether treatment's working. Things like the neuropathy impairment score, uh, nerve conduction studies, summated CMAPs, quantitative autonomic and sensory testing. And before treatment, we should think about what the goal of the treatment is. Is it to cure the neuropathy? Is it to get improvement? Or is it to stop the progression? Such as in a sensory neuropathy, you may not make the patient better, but you may stop the progression. This is an example of the neuropathy impairment score. Uh, this is a summation of muscle weakness, reflex changes, and sensory loss. I'm going to start with a case. This is a 49-year-old woman who was referred to me for CIDP because she had demyelinating nerve conduction studies. She had several-year history of burning feet, a little bit of distal weakness. 
Her neurologic examination showed reduced touch, pin, and vibration in her feet. She had some weakness in her hand and foot. She had mild high arch of the feet and thin ankles. And this is her nerve conduction study. And what was striking to us is that she did not have any temporal dispersion. She had uniform slowing of conduction. Her conduction was 27 meters per second, and almost 51 meters per second. So she had uniform demyelination. I asked her if anyone in the family had a neuropathy like hers. She said no, but she did admit that her mother had ugly feet. And by ugly feet, she uh, had foot drop, and she had ulcers in her feet. And then her daughter had very high arches of the feet, but didn't have any symptoms. And so in the end, these three women all had sharp and retooth 1A. They all looked very different, but they all end up having a duplication of peripheral myelin 1322. So this is not CIDP. This is her mother's nerve conductions. And again, uh, it's conducting 18 meters per second, but there is no temporal dispersion. And her daughter, who had no symptoms, had a conduction of 30 meters per second, but no temporal dispersion. So CMT1A was originally described as a variant of CMT by my father, and he and Ed Lambert showed that nerve conduction velocity was a good way of actually identifying people who are affected. And this chart from one large family, normals are dark circles, affected people are open circles, and X's are people that they couldn't tell if they were affected or not. And you can see that if they had slowed conduction velocities, they ended up being affected. And if they had normal conduction velocity, they were not affected. And this is a picture of onion bulbs in a patient with CMT1A. And you can see there is ubiquitous onion bulbs around almost every single fiber there, meaning that the demyelination is uniform. And so the pathology predicts the electrophysiology. All fibers are equally affected, and so they all conduct at the same slow pace. So what lessons can we learn from this first case? The first very important lesson is that you have to make the right diagnosis. CMT, or inherited neuropathy, unlike CIDP, will not respond to immunotherapy. So many cases that are thought to have CIDP really have another diagnosis. You have to make the diagnosis correctly. So one of the main reasons for treatment non-responsiveness or refractoriness is the fact that the CIDP diagnosis is wrong in the first place. So Jeff Allen and Richard Lewis in uh, the journal Neurology in 2015 found that 27 of 57 patients, or 47%, referred for CIDP, failed to meet the diagnostic criteria. And the reasons were mildly high CSF protein, mild demyelinating findings, and patients uh, who reported subjective response to improvement. So it's important, again, to have objective measures when measuring improvement in CIDP. So if CMT is not CIDP, then what is CIDP? CIDP stands for Chronic Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyradicular Neuropathy. A re treatment responsive recurrent uh, neuropathy was first recognized by Jim Austin in 1958, but it really wasn't until 1975 when Peter Dick, my father, who's pictured in this picture, and co-workers named this condition CIDP by describing the natural history, the clinical electrodiagnostic, CSF, and pathological findings in 53 personally seen patients. So CIDP is usually a slowly worsening neuropathy in contrast to Guillain-Barre syndrome or AIDP. CIDP is characterized by progressive weakness, sensory loss, and worsens for at least eight weeks. It is a symmetrical polyradicular neuropathy, meaning that proximal and distal segments are involved. Motor and sensory fibers are involved. It's usually motor predominant, and it's large fiber predominant, meaning that muscle weakness and sensory attacks are the predominant features. And the reason for this is that those are the systems that have the largest myelinated fibers, and since this is a demyelinating neuropathy, those fibers with the most myelin 
be, would be the ones that you would expect to be the most involved. Sensory loss and curtain are common. Pain and autonomic symptoms are uncommon. And again, the reason for that is that the pain fibers are mostly unmyelinated fibers, so they tend not to be very much involved. There are usually three courses, relapsing, remitting, stepwise, and gradual progressive. It's more common in adults than in children, and in older adults it's usually progressive, where in children it's often relapsing and remitting. Patients present with progressive weakness or sensory ataxia. On examination, it's symmetrical proximal and distal weakness, large fiber predominant, reduced reflexes. Small fibers, temperature and pain are only mildly involved. Nerve conduction studies show demyelination, but the demyelination is not like the CMT that I showed you. There are often conduction blocks, there are long distal latency, long F wave, F -wave latencies, and temporal dispersion. That's because there's unequal demyelination in CIDP. So here's an example of nerve conductions from a CIDP patient, and you can see prominent temporal dispersion and also slow conduction in the demyelinating range. Here's an F wave latency, and the F wave is prolonged at 58 milliseconds. The F uh, wave estimate is 46 milliseconds, so it's longer compared to the estimate, meaning that there is more proximal slowing. CSF protein is usually elevated in more than 90% of CIDP cases, but this is not specific. A high cell count makes things like lymphoma, sarcoidosis, Lyme disease, malignancies more likely. HIV can present in a CIDP-like illness. Monoclonal gammopathy can be found in association with CIDP. A lambda light chain with elevated VEGF levels can be seen in Fome syndrome, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. IgM neuropathy responds less well to immunotherapy. Diabetes mellitus has been reported to be seen in association with CIDP. CIDP is caused by an inflammatory immune demyelination. These fibers show segmental demyelination. The pathological process involves motor fibers, more than sensory fibers, large, more than small fibers, proximal, more than distal fibers. With repeated demyelination and remyelination, you get stacks of Schwann cell processes that pile up. The nerves get big, and those are called onion bulbs because they look like an onion when you cut across them. So here are teased fibers showing segmental demyelination in CIDP. And here is a semi thin epoxy section showing uh, the onion bulbs in CIDP. Now, I want you to notice that there are often large fibers interspersed in here that have no onion bulbs around here. And this, again, is this non-uniform demyelination in contrast to inherited neuropathy that has a uniform demyelination. So you can see that you know, these large onion bulbs interspersed with fibers with no onion bulbs, and that's going to give you kind of dispersion. These fibers are going to conduct better, those fibers are going to conduct worse, and you're going to get spread out of the nerve conduction velocities. So interstitial abnormalities include edema, inflammatory infiltrates, both endoneurial and epineurial. The inflammation is lymphocytic predominant. <coughs> because CID typically involves proximal nerves, serial biopsies may not show much inflammatory demyelination, or proximal fascicular nerve biopsies may. So here is a picture from my father's original paper on CIDP from a proximal body, showing onion bulbs and inflammatory infiltrate. And this is a picture of mine from a proximal fascicular nerve biopsy showing endoneural and epineural inflammation in the side of the nerve. So CIDP can present with different varieties. Classically, it's the symmetrical polyradicular neuropathy that we've been talking about. This is the most common form. But other varieties include multifocal CIDP, also known as the Lewis Sumner syndrome or MAD sound, a purely motor or a purely sensory CIDP, isolated sensory root CIDP, the chronic immune sensory polyradiculopathy, <coughs> persists, diabetic CIDP. And then there are varieties that resemble CIDP, such as the IgM mugus, anti-mag syndrome, multifocal motor neuropathy, forklifters inflammatory neuropathy, and Fohm syndrome. I don't really think of those conditions as being CIDP, but they're certainly similar. So the case two, this is a 39-year-old woman 
who had progressive left ulnar neuropathy and more recently left sciatic neuropathy. She was a dancer when she was about 20 years old. She fell and bruised her ulnar nerve and developed a weak hand with a claw-like deformity. Ten years later, she was making a big dinner for a family for a holiday event, and she dropped a turkey on her mother-in-law while she was serving it. And she thought that that was not a good thing to do, and so she went to see a surgeon and had her ulnar nerve transposed. When they opened the nerve up during the operation and saw that it was very enlarged, so they took a biopsy of this, and they diagnosed her as having plexiform neurofibroma. She then developed weakness of her leg, and she was known to have neurofibromatosis. Years later, she had a viral illness, uh, and she, after the viral illness got weak throughout her body, it said she had Guillain-Barre syndrome, and they treated her with IVIG. And with that, she got stronger throughout her body, including the regions in which were supposed to be due to her neurofibromatosis. That didn't make sense to her doctors, so they referred her to me. A neurologic examination and EMG, she had multiple monoropathies or plexopathies. She did not have any cafe LA spots. She did not have any axillary freckling. So she didn't have any of the typical stigmata of neurofibromatosis. Her CSF protein was elevated at 90. MRI showed marked enlargement in the left brachial plexus and the sacral plexus. And we did an ulnar fascicular nerve biopsy to try to understand what was happening. So this is her MRI of the brachial plexus, and you can see enlargement of the brachial plexus. This is her ulnar nerve at time of biopsy, and it's very enlarged. And this is a longitudinal section from her ulnar nerve, and it is very cellular. There's a lymphocytic uh, abnormality around a blood vessel there. And she had large onion bulbs. So this is h &E. this is S100, and this is all Schwann cells. They're positive for that. And this is all electron microscopy. She had onion bulbs, often around naked axons, sometimes around thin myelin. And uh, so her diagnosis is hypertrophic neuropathy, endoneural edema, onion bulbs. And this is a multifocal CIEP or a Lewis Sumner syndrome. We treated her with IVIG, 0.4 grams per kilogram, twice weekly for four weeks, then once weekly for eight weeks. With this, the strength in her arm and leg improved, though her hand was still somewhat weak. All right, so multifocal CIEP, also called the Lewis Sumner syndrome, or multifocal acquired demyelinating sensory and motor neuropathy, MADSAM, originally described by Lewis Sumner, Brown, and Asbury, 1982. After classical CIDP, multifocal CIDP is the most, com most common subtype. It's an asymmetrical form of CIDP with individual nerves involved in an overlapping patchy way. Uh, it has a similar presentation to multifocal motor neuropathy, but there's sensory involvement. Upper limbs usually are more involved. The CSF protein is usually elevated. There's prominent sensory uh, involvement clinically, electrophysiologically, and pathologically. Nerve conduction studies show asymmetrical demyelination uh, and in both motor and sensory nerves, unlike MMN, which is pure motor. And conduction blocks are seen in both conditions, that is, multiple CIEP and in MMN. This is a picture from uh, Lewis's original paper showing a motor conduction block. GMI antibodies are usually normal in multifocal CIDP. The pathology is the same as classical CIDP, that is inflammatory demyelination. Patients respond to IVIG, <coughs> and prednisone. In contrast, MMN patients uh, do not have improved with steroids. Multifocal CIDP is a form of CIDP, where MMN is not a form of CIDP. Third case, so this is a 66-year-old woman who presented with sensory ataxia over 10 years. She needed two canes to walk. She had absent vibration, joint position, sense of the reflexes with normal strength. Her EMG was normal. And because of the normal EMG, her local doctors told her she was hysterical. Her tibial SSCP showed delayed responses. Her CSF protein was elevated at 103. MRI showed large enhancing nerve roots of the cauda equina and a dorsal lumbar root that was 
her form. So here are her uh, nerve connections. You can see her serial response is 13. And this was perplexing, because this woman had horrendous sensory attacks. See, she couldn't see, feel her feet at all. She didn't know where her feet were in space. She could barely walk. She needed two canes to walk. And, and yet, she had robust serial potentials. We asked ourselves, where in the nervous system could this be? And it seemed to us this had to be at the sensory root level. Her needle examination was normal. Her somatosensory evoked potentials showed delayed responses, so we knew that there was a dip, some problem in the somatosensory pathway. Her lumbar roots were enlarged. And we did a dorsal root lid biopsy. So the patient is on the bottom. Uh, she has essentially no fibers. Here's a post-mortem control. You can see lots of different fibers there. And uh, there's a large fiber peak. And the, the low fiber peak is gone. I think I've hit this many times, so I've got to go back a lot. It's in the same place where I am. All right. So immunohistochemistry uh, showed some scattered CD45 and CD68 cells. Uh, the controls had none of those. And on electron microscopy, there were frequent onion bulb formations. So the pathology was loss of large fibers, endoneural macrophages, onion bulbs. And we gave her a diagnosis of chronic immune sensory polyradiculopathy. Um, we treated her with IVIG. I told her I didn't think that she was going to get better quickly. She had lost all these large fibers. She had this bad sensory ataxia. I thought it, I, it would take a long time for her to improve. But to my surprise, she got better very quickly. And she came in walking, and she went back to hiking in the mountains without any AIDS. It was a very dramatic response. We identified 15 such patients, and uh, seven of them in retrospectively, but eight of them prospectively, and we treated them. And they had very remarkable improvement with neuro, with uh, IVIG and uh, steroids. So chronic mean sensory polyradiculopathy, or CISP, CISP is a restricted form of CIDP confined to the sensory roots. <coughs> patients, excuse me, patients present with pure sensory syndrome, no weakness, uh, and with sensory ataxia. Nerve conduction studies and electromography are normal, making it confusing for the evaluating uh, physician. And hence, uh, some of them tell their patients they're hysterical. It responds favorably to immunotherapy. So here are thickened nerve roots in the cis patient. And here are uh, three biopsy patients. You can see all three of them have lost of large fibers. <coughs> Two of them had endoneural macrophages and onion bulbs. And one of them, there was enough length of fiber to tease fibers on, and it showed demyelination. So there is the demyelination on the one that had enough to uh, have um, teased on. And here you can see uh, endoneural macrophages associated with onion bulbs. And there is another electron microscopy showing highly developed onion bulbs in fibers with very little myelin. <coughs> so CISP is a chronic immune sensory polyradiculopathy, and it's a restricted form of CIDP localized to the nerve to the sensory root level, responding favorably to immunotherapy. It causes a sensory ataxia. There are normal nerve conductions, delayed SSEP responses, thickened nerve roots and MRI, elevated CSF protein, and inflammatory demyelinating changes. It can be easily missed, and patients uh, often are diagnosed as being hysterical. Now, CISP is a very restricted form of sensory CIDP. Shin Ao and colleagues described sensory CIDP in 10 cases they call it chronic sensory demyelinating neuropathy. They, uh, their features were progressive course, pure sensory neuropathy, high CSF protein, electrophysiological evidence of demyelination, demyelination on uh, teased fibers, and improved neurologic symptoms with immunotherapy. The authors concluded that chronic sensory demyelinating neuropathy is a form of sensory CIDP. CIS appears to be a, fem a similar syndrome but that's even more confined just to the sensory roots. Recently, an association with CIDP-like illness has been noted with paranodal antibodies, neurofashion 155, 
and contact in one. Patients with NF-155 antibodies are younger, have sensory ataxia, a tremor, and associated CNS demyelination. Patients with contact in one antibodies are older, have aggressive course and more axonal degeneration. Poor responsiveness to, responsiveness to IVIG has been reported. Rituximab may be more effective. Further work is needed. Canamab in CIDP. One form of an inflammatory sensory neuropathy is the chronic ataxic neuropathy of thalmoplegia, M proteins, agglutinins, and disyla antibodies, or canamab. Canamab patients present with sensory neuropathy, ataxia, paralysis of eye movements, difficulty swallowing and speaking. Patients have anti diacylo antibodies and are reported to respond favorably to immunotherapy. Canamab may be a form of chronic Miller Fisher syndrome, like CIEP is a form of chronic Guillain Barre syndrome. So, how does one treat CIEP? Randomized controlled trials have shown benefit for prednisone, plasma exchange, and IVIG. CITP should respond to immunotherapy, and if it does not, another diagnosis should be thought of, such as Pohm syndrome, lymphoma, Muggles associated neuropathies, CMT, and others. So, dexamethasone versus prednisolone in CIDP is a PREDICT study. 40 patients with CIDP were randomized to receive pulse high dose dexamethasone versus oral prednisolone. 24 received dexamethasone, 16 prednisolone. After a year, uh, 16 were in remission, 10 dexamethasone, and 6 prednisolone. The side effects were very similar, except for more cushionary facies in the prednisolone group, and pulse high dose dexamethasone worked well. They didn't do a comparison to IVIG. What do I do? I like IV methylprednisolone, so I don't like using oral daily prednisone. So I often will give a gram three times a week of IV methylprednisolone and one gram weekly. You see in the back in 12 weeks, recheck the NIS, and then I titrate it based on that. Agitation and insomnia are common, but many of the other side effects of uh, oral steroids are reduced, and some patients tolerate IV methylprednisolone for a long time. Plasma exchange in CIDP. Two double-blind, sham-controlled, randomized studies have shown that plasma exchange is an effective treatment. One done by my father, one done by Angelica Hahn. Treatment was effective, but beneficial effects wore off after weeks to months. Because plasma exchange needs to be given in a medical center, it is usually not the first-line treatment. It's important to space up the treatments twice weekly for four months and once weekly for eight weeks. Reevaluate in 12 weeks with the neuropathy impairment score in titrate. IVIG. IVIG has become the mainline treatment for CIDP. Several large randomized controlled trials have shown that IVIG is effective. Um, a long term follow up study IVIG was an effective uh, treatment for 81% of CIDP patients, where 86% need to ongoing IVIG. The effect of IVIG is short-lived, and patients need ongoing treatment. So this is a study by my father where it was an IVIG versus plasma exchange study in a crossover design. So initially, half the patients got plasma exchange, half of them got IVIG. There was improvement of the neuropathy impairment score, so it went in the positive direction. The patients were then washed out. In general, there was a worsening of the neuropathy impairment score, so it went in the negative direction. And they were crossed over to the opposite treatment and treated with that. And in general, there was improvement for the opposite treatment. So IVIG and plasma exchange in that study seemed to be equal in both effective treatments. The ICE study was a study that led for the FDA approval of IVIG in America for CIDP. So 117 patients participated in a randomized double-blind placebo crossover study. Loading dose of two grams, per, uh, two grams per kilogram, followed by a maintenance dose of one gram per kilogram. The primary endpoint was uh, those that improved by an NCAT score of one point through week, week 24. 54% of the patients with IVIG versus 21% with placebo improved after 24 weeks. Patients who continued to receive IVIG took a longer time to relapse. <coughs> So IVIG is the uh, first-line treatment for CIDP. Uh, many physicians use it 
on a once every three week uh, basis. As we um, and that works for a lot of patients, but some patients have a wearing off uh, before their next dose, and it's as if they were on a roller coaster. Because CIDP is a chronic illness, I don't think you have to use large boluses often the way you do with AIDP. So I think it's often reasonable to give smaller, more frequent doses to avoid that wearing off phenomenon. I think it is important to realize you don't need to use one standard dose. So I use different doses depending on what the situation is. So in a severe worsening case, I may give two grams per kilogram in divided doses over five days, and then 0.4 grams per kilogram twice weekly for four weeks, and then 0.4 grams per kilogram once weekly for eight weeks. In moderately severe cases, you may start with something like 0.4 grams per kilogram weekly for 12 weeks, and in mild cases, something like 0.4 grams per kilogram once every other week for uh, 12 weeks. The important thing is you have to reevaluate periodically. I often like doing that at 12 weeks, and then you titrate the dose depending on the response. And it's important to use quantitative measures, something like the Neuropathy Paris score and the Sunday at CMAP. So you titrate the IVIG dose by treatment response. Patients will need different amounts of IVIG. And just because a standard dose is used in the ICE study does not mean that there's one standard dose that works for all CIDP patients. You need to treat aggressively at first, and then you try to wean off. It's also important to discuss the goal of treatment with your patients. You're not trying to make people 100% better. You're trying to often make them 90% better. Because 100% uh, requires too much drug, and it's often unrealistic. You adjust, adjust the dosage and frequency of IVIG based on the patient's response, and you reassess regularly, often every three months. And the goal always is try to get your patients off treatment. So you, you, you try to get them better, and then you try to wean them off. Subcutaneous uh, uh, immunoglobulin. Several small studies suggest that subcutaneous immunoglobulin is an attractive alternative to IVIG. Most patients included previously responded to IVIG. Patients were treated with a weekly dose of subcutaneous IG and compared to uh, every three weeks IVIG. And patient, in general, the patients who did, uh, they did pretty well when they switched to subcutaneous IG. The major advantage with subcutaneous is can be self-administered. The efficacy seems very similar to IVIG. So a prospective multicenter randomized study of double-blind placebo-controlled uh, was published uh, earlier this year. It's called the PATH study, and they compared three groups. 0.2 grams per kilogram, 0.4 grams per kilogram, and placebo. And to get into the study, they had to show that they still needed IVIG. So patients were followed off treatment in an IVIG dependency period. Uh, and those patients who developed a relapse were then uh, uh, randomized into the study. The ones that didn't worsen were not put into the study. Patients uh, who improved in the NCAT story will continue with the subcutaneous IVIG. So patients that were randomized into one of the three doses, and then they were looked at for a year. The study endpoints were uh, the inflammatory neuropathy cause and treatment, the NCAT score, maximal grip strength, MRC sum score, rash, uh, disability score, and electrophysiology. The drug Hyzentra was used. So 172 patients were randomized. It's the largest uh, CIDP study. A third into placebo, a third into low dose subcutaneous, and a third into high dose subcutaneous. During the treatment period, 63% uh, of the placebo had worsening. 39% of the low dose subcutaneous had worsening, and 33% of the high dose had worsening. Uh, and 18% of the placebo had an adverse uh, reaction, where 30% of the low dose and 34% of the high dose had uh, some sort of reaction. So the absolute risk reduction was 25% for low dose versus placebo, and 30% uh, for high dose versus placebo, and those were significant. So this is uh, that in graphic form. And there's the D study. Secondary immunosuppressive agents in CIDP. Other agents are often used in combination with IVIG plasma exchange to reduce the dosage of the primary agent. And these include azathioprine and Salcept. So with azathioprine, you often start at 15 milligrams per day and titrate to a goal of 2 to 3 milligrams per kilogram a day. 
in uh, microfilming small fertility, usually the dose is one gram twice daily. And we use these drugs in a way to try to get people off of IVIG or to a lower dose of IVIG. Cyclophosphamide has been used orally at one to two milligrams per kilogram a day, uh, 50 to 100 uh, milligrams per day, or in intravenous pulsing. Rituximab uh, controlled studies are lacking, but often will dose it at 375 milligrams per meter squared and given weekly for four weeks, and you can repeat that every six months. Uh, in general, I think it's important to keep the IVIG going until these other agents take effect that you're going to use. And then there's the autologous peripheral uh, blood stem cell transplant or a bone marrow transplant. So case reports in several small series of reporting efficacy of autologous stem cell transplant CIDP. Uh, in one report, there are 11 cases. And in that, um, uh, there was improvement. Three of 11 patients then developed a relapse uh, during the follow-up period, but eight of 11 remained uh, in drug-free remission. So results suggest there is potential efficacy and further studies are needed. In the USA, insurance companies will not pay for this stuff, so that's a real problem. We can't use this. So how do you treat refractory CIDP or difficult to treat CIDP? If the neuropathy is not improving with IVIG, then the neurologic exam in the NIS is getting worse, I think the first thing you do is increase the dosage and frequency of the IVIG, and then you access the treatment response three months later. If after the IVIG is increased and the patient's neurologic examination is still worsening, you may want to switch to another treatment. You can add or switch to IV methylprednisolone or prednisone plasma exchange. As I say, these can be done in isolation or in combination with IVIG. Some patients only respond to one treatment, so they may respond to IVIG and not plasma exchange or vice versa or to steroids. Most patients with CIDP do respond to one of the proven treatments, the corticosteroids, the IVIG, or the plasma exchange, alone or in combination. If a patient does not improve with immunotherapy, the diagnosis of CIDP needs to be questioned and further work that needs to be done. However, relapses or worsening of disease spontaneously or with, uh, during the of the treatment are common and should be expected. In severe cases, CIDB can be a fatal disease. Reasons why patients are unresponsive. It's a very severe disease. It's the wrong diagnosis. It's not CIDB. Not enough treatment is given. Or there's significant exonal loss. In CIDP cases with severe weakness, dense fibrillation potentials, muscle atrophy, uh, it's important to discuss that with the patient that you're going to need prolonged treatment in order to get any improvement. So in severe cases, bi-weekly IVIG or bi-weekly plasma exchange given for as long as a year may be necessary. And I've seen such cases going from being in wheelchairs to being uh, going to walking. So in the right cases, it's important to be aggressive and keep at it. Use of combinations are okay. So IVIG and IV methylprednisolone used together. Plasma exchange followed by IVIG. Rituximab with IVIG. Cytoxin with IVIG are some potential combinations. One needs to be more aggressive in severe cases. At the end of the talk here, the last part, I'm going to talk about neuropathies that resemble CIDP, CIDP lookalikes. And these include the IgM anti-mag neuropathy, multifocal motor neuropathy, poor corpus inflammatory neuropathy, and foam syndrome. So IgM anti-mag neuropathy, uh, a demyelinating polyneuropathy associated with IgM monoclonal protein, uh, often kappa. Many of the cases have antibodies to myelin-associated like protein or mag. This is a sensory predominant syndrome that presents with sensory ataxia. The patients have a link dependent neuropathy, sensory predominant with mild weakness combined to, com confined to distal segments. The pattern involvement in these patients has been described as DADS, or distal acquired demyelinating symmetric and sensory predominant. Distal latencies of the IgM neuropathy will be long, with conduction velocities are only minimally slowed. There have been reports of deposits of IgM and complement on the myelin sheaths. It's an inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy. 
So here are the widening of the myeloma lamellae. Response is less favorable than to other inflammatory neuropathies. So my father showed that the IBG and the IgA neuropathies respond better to plasma exchange than the IgM. IBIG still helps uh, some people with IgM neuropathy. Studies of rituximab have shown some promising results. The neuropathies tend to be mild. There's debate whether you should treat these patients at all. And so I think you want to talk to your patients whether you should treat them. <coughs> Physicians and patients have to decide together where treat, with, whether treatment is warranted or not. Multifocal motor neuropathy is an asymmetric upper limb predominant motor neuropathy with focal conduction block, slow progression, weakness, normal sensory examination. Looks like ALS, but only lower motor findings. Originally, MMN was felt to be a subtype of CIDP, but it's now felt to be a unique and separate disease. So here is a motor conduction block in MMN. And here is a work that we did on, um, we took nerve biopsies from seven patients at the site of conduction block with MMN. We did not find angel myelination, we found focal fiber loss. MMN responds to immunotherapy, especially IDIG, but not as well as CIDP. Four small randomized studies showed a benefit with IDIG. Uh, usually there's rapid improvement that's to be, uh, the, at the beginning, but that's usually temporary, and then it just, you're trying to maintain them. Since MMN is a, uh, is a chronic, gradually worsening disease, I'll often treat with something like IVIG 0.4 grams per kilogram weekly for 12 weeks and then titrate. Case four. <coughs> so 51 year old white woman with subacute symmetric distal tingling hypersensitivity to the feet. By three months, the symptoms ascended to involve her legs and thighs. She had difficulty climbing stairs, needed to use her hands to pull herself up. She didn't smoke. She worked at a pork processing plant cutting meat off a hog's heads. Her motor examination showed mild weakness in proximal and distal muscles and arms and legs. Her sensory examination showed uh, reduced touch, pinprick, vibration in feet and toes. Her reflexes were reduced. Her gait was ataxic. She had difficulty with tandeming. She couldn't walk in heels and toes. She had caused a rhombus syndrome. Her nerve conduction studies showed a long perineal uh, latency, although her conduction velocity was okay. Her F wave was prolonged. The F estimate was 54 milliseconds. Her F wave latency was 69.9 milliseconds. So it suggested proximal slowing in the nerves. Her serial response was normal. Her trigeminal blink response, the R1 was 28. It should be less than 13. So that's markedly prolonged. Nerve conduction uh, studies should have demyelinated polyradicular neuropathy, mostly in distal and proximal segments. Her CSF protein was elevated at 125. She had positive rheumatological test. Uh, her ANA was uh, elevated. Her SSA was elevated. A serial nerve biopsy was performed. Her T fibers showed both axonal degeneration and segmental demyelination. There's a demyelinated segment between the two arrows. She had small collections of inflammation around blood vessels. And this is one of the cases of an inflammatory polyradicular neuropathy that occurred in pork plant workers that we described a few years ago. So 21 workers in one Minnesota pork plant developed a new neurologic uh, symptoms in 2006 and 2007. All the workers were exposed to the kill room and came into close proximity to a brain removal area. The pig's brains were removed using pressurized air. A hose was inserted to the base of the skull and the brains were blown out with pressurized air and the brains often were aerosolized. And so here is a picture of that. Those are the pig's heads and that tube uh, right here would be inserted into the base of the head and the, and the brains would be blown out and the workers would not wear masks, and so they would often breathe in the aerosolized pig brains, and they were auto-inoculizing themselves against brain tissue. So, 95% of these patients have pain. They often have positive nerve stretch signs. 81% have weakness on examination. 
81% had uh, complaints of tingling, and almost all of them had difficulty with walking. Uh, they all, or most of them, had very stereotypical nerve conductions. That is, very long distal latencies. Here's a tibia with a prolonged distal latency. Long F waves, this left uh, F wave latency is 101, it should be 58. And here they, they are summarized. Uh, and what these showed is that there was abnormality of very focal areas in the nerve, at the very distal and the very proximal parts of the nerve. And those are the parts of the nerve where the blood nerve barrier is the weakest. So we hypothesize that this is where antibodies that had been developed against the pig brain tissue had access to the nervous system, causing this polyradicular neuropathy. So on electron microscopy, we showed in naked axons, as shown on the left, and small onion bulbs, as shown on the right. Van de Lennon and colleagues uh, showed a uh, signature stain pattern in patients' IgG. So a stereotypical polyradicular neuropathy occurred in poor plant workers exposed to aerosolized brain tissue. On nerve conduction studies, it was very proximal, very distal uh, involvement, regions where the blood nerve barrier is the least robust. Nerve biopsies suggest inflammatory demyelinating cause. All patients here had a distinct IgG biomarker. Tires correlated with proximity to the brain extraction site. Patients improved spontaneously with immunotherapy. Our findings suggest that the sensory of predominant polyradicular neuropathy is caused by autoimmunity induced by exposure to aerosolized pig brain. And I'm going to end this talk today on Pohm syndrome. So Pohm syndrome is a perineoplastic neuropathy associated with osteosporotic myeloma or Tausman's disease. Pohm stands for polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, and monoclonal protein skin change. The most prominent feature of Pohm syndrome is the polyneuropathy. So, to make the diagnosis, you have to have the two major criteria, or two mandatory criteria, one major criteria, one minor criteria. The mandatory uh, criteria are polyneuropathy and monoclonal uh, plasma cell uh, dyscrasia. The main issue of Pohm syndrome is the neuropathy. Uh, it usually begins with prickling, tingling, sensory loss in the feet. With time, sensory loss is overshadowed with motor deficits. Patients have difficulty climbing stairs, gripping objects, ambulating, and may progress to wheelchairs. Pain is common where autonomic abnormalities are uncommon. Pohm syndrome and CIEP look very similar. So oftentimes, uh, Pohm syndrome will be misdiagnosed as CIEP. Both conditions present as a motor predominant demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. So if a case of apparent CIEP with clear demyelination does not respond to IVIG, but instead worsens, you should strongly consider Pohm syndrome. All cases with suspected CIEP should have serum and urine uh, monoclonal proteins, immunofixation, and skeletal bone surgeries. <clears throat> so, this study compared Pohm's syndrome's clinical features to CIEP, and in general, Pohm's patients were older, had less cranial nerve involvement, more muscle atrophy, more distal weakness, more positive nerve stretch signs, and I think the most important thing is more pain. CIEP usually doesn't have a lot of pain. Pohm's syndrome usually does have a lot of pain, so I think that's a very important thing to distinguish these. We, Michelle Marman, Eric Sorensen, and I did a study comparing nerve conduction studies of POMS to CIDP. In general, POMS has greater motor uh, reduction in motor amplitudes, more slowing in motor and sensory conduction velocities, uh, less prolongation of distal latencies, and absence of serial sparing. POMS syndrome has more fibrillation potentials, uh, more zonal loss, uh, higher motor terminal latency indices. Uh, and these findings imply that Holmes is more uniformly distributed with more zonal degeneration, and CIDP is more proximal and distal predominant. There are biomarkers in Holmes syndrome. A hallmark of the Holmes syndrome is the presence of angiogenic and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So levels of vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, IL-1 beta, IL-6, tumor process factor alpha, are all increased in homes. VEGF level has become a very good biomarker for homes. 
also elevated platelet levels, normal cytosis, is a good biomarker for commas. So here's a study comparing different phenotologic disorders with Crohn's and Castleman's, and the VEGF level is much more elevated in Crohn's and Castleman's than in other hematological conditions. And this is uh, the same cohort where we compared nerve conduction studies of Crohn's and CIDP, showing that in half the cases of Crohn's, the platelet level will be elevated versus 1% of CIDP. Ezekiel Pacioni and I looked at the nerve pathology findings in 35 Crohn's biopsies compared to 26 CIDP biopsies. The pathological features of Crohn's showed a perineoplastic vasculopathy where CIDP showed inflammatory demyelination. So Crohn's biopsies had significantly more epidural neovascularization <coughs> and exogenal uh, degeneration. CIDP biopsies had more onion bulbs and endoneural inflammation. So, these little blood vessels are very common in Combs biopsies and CIDP, you don't see those. If you see onion bulbs, it's much more likely to be CIDP than it is to be Combs. You will see more exalted degeneration like in panel A, but demyelination such as B and C are seen both in CIDP and in Combs. So how do you treat Combs? Combs does not respond to conventional immunotherapy, so in case of refractory CIDP, Crohn's should be considered. Treatment in Crohn's is aimed at the underlying malignancy. Radiation for the plasma cell uh, uh, disorder, chemotherapy, or autologous stem cell transplant. So this is an algorithm for treating uh, Crohn's. If you have uh, less than three lesions and your bone marrow biopsy is negative, you treat with radiation. If you have more than three lesions and your bone marrow biopsy is positive, you treat with chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. So 38 patients uh, with uh, less than three uh, lesions were treated with isolated radiation. At four years, 97% were still alive, but half of them did need to go on to chemotherapy. Chemotherapy uh, often is uh, alpha later based therapy, corticosteroids, high dose chemotherapy with uh, bone marrow transplant. So the and colleagues did a retrospective study in 59 uh, cases of autologous stem cell transplants. The five-year survival was 94%. The progression-free survival was 98% at one year, 75% at five years. And the progression usually was elevated VEGF levels or changes radiographically. Symptom progression was rare. Shafiq Karam and we did a study looking at the, how the neuropathy did in homeless patients after autologous stem cell transplant. So we looked at 60 patients in the Mayo Clinic who had received autologous stem cell transplants. All the patients had neuropathy impairment scores, modified Rankin scores, and nerve conductions done. 80% had sensory symptoms, 65 had pain, 88 had weakness, 45% uh, were in wheelchairs, 88% of them had demyelination on nerve conduction studies. All patients except for one had improvement on the neuropathy impairment score and modified Rankin score. That patient had post-transplant uh, sepsis and died. The median NIS improved from 66 points to 48 points to 30 points. There was a significant correlation between the improvement in the NIS score and VEGF levels. So this is improvement of the neuropathy impairment score. All patients had, except for one had improvement of the modified Rankin score. They went from three to two to 1.5. At baseline, 27% or 45% were in wheelchairs, uh, 17 were in walkers. Uh, at the end of the study, no patients were still in wheelchairs. 5% uh, were in walkers, 12% were in canes. So there was a marked improvement to their ambulation. Uh, there was also improvement of the nerve conduction studies. So the amplitudes improved. The ulnar CMAP went from 4.3 millivolts to 6.5 millivolts to 7.6 millivolts and the <clears throat> conduction velocities uh, went about faster, from 34 meters per second to 43 meters per second to 51 meters per second. So Palm syndrome mimics CIDP, and so cases thought to be refractory CIDP who don't respond, uh, you should think about Palm's, VEGF levels, thrombocytosis are useful biomarkers, <coughs> and nerve conduction studies and uh, nerve pathology show uniform demyelination and exalted degeneration in Crohn's. 
Holmes treatment with autologous stem cell transplant had meaningful and significant improvements from a neurologic uh, point of view. All right, well, I've given you a lot of information about CIDP and their localites. CIDP is an inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy that's motor predominant with symmetrical weakness in proximal and distal segments. There are different varieties of CIDP that uh, present with different clinical phenotypes, including classical, multifocal, CISP, and others. The first step in treatment of CIDP is the correct diagnosis, and many patients are wrongly diagnosed and so don't respond to treatment. CISP is a form of CIDP confined to the sensory roots and presents with sensory ataxia and normal nerve conductions, and it gets better with immunotherapy. Multifocal CIDP MATSAM presents with asymmetrical motor and sensory neuropathy, <coughs> often most in the upper limbs. There are three proven treatments for CIDP, including steroids, plasma exchange, and IVIG. Other agents may be useful. Crohn's syndrome is a perineoplastic demyelinating neuropathy that resembles CIDP, but does not respond to a traditional immunotherapy. And uh, there, this is the work of a lot of other people besides me, and thank you for your attention. stem cell transplantation, what kind of cell exactly? And it was an intravenous injection of what kind of cell? It's yeah, so, so marrow, brain marrow, uh, bone marrow stem cells or stem cell from fat tissue or hematological, what kind of thing? Yeah, so, so they are sometimes bone marrow, <coughs> bone marrow but often given intravenously uh, through blood. And so, another question is, it's not directly relative to the representation, but it's very interesting. Is there any treatment for uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, at least for any molecular form of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease? Some experimental therapeutic problems. So is there treatment for Charcot-Marie Tooth disease? There, there is becoming an increasing uh, excitement about doing studies in Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. So at this point, there is no treatment for Charcot-Marie yeah. Tooth disease, but I think that will change, actually. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are right, studies being done. Right soon, you hope. Well, I, I hope yeah. so, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so can one in, in increase the doses of IVIG? Yeah, I, I, I think one can. I mean, I, I think I, I don't like going more than about one gram per kilogram at, at, at a particular dose just because of viscosity issues and all that, but, but, but I, I think you can increase it, I, you know. So I do have patients who are getting very high doses of IVIG. Um, and I think at higher doses, you're worried about increased risk of stroke and kidney problems and things like that, but one can go to higher doses. Спасибо. Какие объемы плазмы вы удаляете у пациентов с ХВДП, если применяете плазмоферез первично и в рамках поддерживающей терапии? Следующий вопрос по поводу форм. Фокальная, моторная. И есть ли, вот, по данным вашей практики, такая так называемая парапаритическая форма, при которой возможно симметричное вовлечение только ног при отсутствии изменений в руках? Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, so the first question is about the volumes of plasma exchange. Uh, how much do you use um, a first step in aggressive therapy and then I'm supporting the patient? And the second question about um, the paraparetic form of CIDP. Did you have the patients who had only the paresis in legs, symmetrical? Well, so for the, the first question, I honestly defer to the plasma exchange um, group. I mean, I, so we usually do, the volume I don't know, but you usually do sort of three to four exchanges of, of body volume. I don't know exactly what, you know, what that translates into. And again, I, there is a 
exchange group that decides that and that work with them. So I don't usually say a whole lot about that. In terms of a paraparetic form of CIDP, yeah, I mean, I think we all, we can see multifocal CIDP, so that can present as a pure upper limb, pure lower limb. I think one always then is concerned with spinal cord pathology or something like that, so you always want to be thinking about that, but yeah, I've seen that. And uh, the question is about forms, uh, multifocal form, uh, focal forms. How often do you have such patients in your daily practice? So how often do I have multifocal CIDP? I have more multifocal CIDP than I have symmetrical CIDP. But that doesn't mean that it's more common. Because I make a living seeing more uncommon, harder to treat things. And so classical CIDP is well recognized by community neurologists in America. And so they treat it. And so it rarely makes its way to see us where the more difficult focal forms are less easily identified, and so they more frequently will come to us. And sometimes we see even very focal forms where there isn't necessarily the demyelination of nerve conductions because they're so fo focal. And that is a place where nerve biopsy has actually been very helpful because we biopsy nerves at sites of imaging abnormality and seen very focal demyelination that's not apparent electrophysiologically. Thank you very much. Of course, пожалуйста. Спасибо большое за доклад. Нельзя ли более подробно рассказать об эффективности препарата Хизентра при разных формах ВДП, длительности применения препарата? I actually have been fairly popular with CSL bearing and some of these subcutaneous companies because many experts in CIDP have advocated that you need to use a very high dose of IVIG. And I've always said you don't necessarily need to do that. You can use smaller doses spaced out. You cannot use very high doses in subcutaneous IG because they're, they're not absorbed well. So, so there's a limitation. And so because I've argued for smaller, more frequent doses for IVIG, that's actually a popular way of giving the subcutaneous IG. So typically, you'll give something like 0.4 grams per kilogram once weekly, or if you need a higher dose twice weekly, subcutaneous. And you can use three or four injection sites at one time. Um, and so the dose ends up being a very similar dose to what you use with IVIG. It just has to be used in smaller, more frequent doses than with IVIG. In terms of effectiveness, um, it seems to be equally effective. However, no one has done a study where it is the primary first treatment. It's always been done where somebody has been on IVIG and then has been transitioned to subcutaneous IG. And so some people argue, well, you need to do such a study. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I mean, the, the PATH study I thought was quite rigorous in that they took patients who were on IVIG, they stopped them, they then only took patients who were actually worsened to put them into the subcutaneous study. So they proved that the patients they were using the subcutaneous needed treatment, and then they showed that the subcutaneous ones improved uh, more than the ones on placebo. And the way they did it is they looked for relapse rates. So the placebo had much more relapse rates than the ones on subcutaneous. I think it's more of a realistic answer, because the answer was clear. The two words. Или два раза в неделю, то есть это зависит от общей дозы, которую необходимо пациенту. 
и она рассчитывается индивидуально и также цифруется в зависимости от неврологического дефицита в течение определенного времени, обычно через три месяца. Спасибо. Еще вопросы, пожалуйста. Так, кто первый? cases our CRDP or not or only CRDP like syndromes or if our patient uh, haven't got any response to the therapy yeah so how often do I do nerve biopsy so I am the head of the peripheral nerve biopsy lab in Mayo Clinic and so it is a joke in America that I biopsy all of the patients that I see that is not true <laughs> А профессор руководит лабораторией заболеваний периферической нервной системы и отдельная лаборатория по патоморфологии периферических нервов. И в Америке ходит шутка, что он делает биопсии всем подряд. I probably biopsy more nerve patients than anybody does, though, in America. Конечно, он делает биопсии чаще, чем кто-либо другой. Maybe in the world. Maybe. Nonetheless, it's probably 15 or 20 percent of the patients I see. Обычно это 15-20 процентов, которые. So 80 percent, 85 percent of the patients I see, I don't do a nerve biopsy. Да, 85 percent случаев, конечно же, не. And so specifically to the patients that I do biopsy, do I biopsy all CIDP? No. If somebody comes in with a very classical looking CIDP, a polyradicular neuropathy, nerve conduction studies that are slow, temporal dispersion, you know, they haven't been treated, I'm not going to biopsy that person, it's, it's CIDP until proven otherwise. I will do metastatic bone surveys, I will do an HIV, I will do look for monoclonal proteins, all of that's normal, I'm just going to treat that patient. So, I biopsy patients who need a nerve biopsy, you know, that, that's a bit of a smart aleck response to that. But if I think this is a complicated, diff difficult patient, and I need to know what's happening pathologically, then I will do a nerve biopsy. Which nerve do I biopsy? I biopsy nerves that are clinically affected. So if it's a length-dependent neuropathy, I will do a sterile nerve biopsy. If it's a multifocal neuropathy, I will biopsy a nerve in a clinically involved distribution. So sensory nerves that are easily biopsied are sural nerve, superficial perineal nerve, superficial radial nerve, the lateral or the median antibrachial cutaneous nerves, the great auricular nerve in the back of the head. So if somebody has a lot of facial involvement and they're numb in the back of their neck, the great auricular nerve is a good nerve to biopsy. Now that's just cutaneous nerve biopsies or, or sensory nerve biopsies that lie under the skin. We also do targeted fascicular nerve biopsies. So we do an MRI, and we image the nerves, and we take a piece of that nerve and leave most of it behind. And typical nerves that we'll do for that are sciatic nerves, and you can do median, ulnar, you know, radial, just depending on the nerves that are involved. А профессор не делает биопсии всем пациентам с ХВДП, то есть если это классическая картина, если подтверждается диагноз на основании uh, других обследований, то биопсия не нужна. Но биопсия требуется только в тех случаях, когда все предыдущие обследования были нехроматичны, и нужно понять, что же происходит в интерстиции и непосредственно с этим миром. Uh, какие нервы можно исследовать? Uh, обычно исследуются сенсорные нервы, но это в случае, если это дистальная полиневропатия, преимущественно это икроножный нерв, это может быть поверхностный малобрацовый или поверхностный научевой нерв. Если пациент жалуется на менее волости шеи и головы, это может быть большой ушной нерв. Однако, если это какая-то фокальная или мультифокальная полиневропатия, то тогда уж можно провести биопсию направленную фастикулярно, но тогда это будет зависеть, может и седалищный нерв быть, и срединный, и так далее. Вопрос такой, как он тебе, Сейчас, подождите, микрофончик, пожалуйста. Ваш отец, вы активно изучаете проблему ХВТП, ассоциированной с сахаровым диабетом. И ваша школа впервые предложила рассматривать ХВТП, ассоциированную с сахаровым диабетом, как отдельный вариант ХВДП. 
Ну, и у меня вопрос, в отличие, есть ли какие-то особенности при ФОДП, ассоциированные с сахарным диабетом в клинической картине, в электрофизиологической картине, соответственно, подхода к лечению, насколько безопасно лечить таких пациентов высокими дозами глюкокортикоидов, и все-таки почему у пациентов с сахарным диабетом такая высокая часа сахара ОДП? This is the question about um, diabetes therapy. Uh, so um, the question is about um, are there any specific features for that form of CIDP? Why there is a very high association of um, CIDP and um, diabetes? And um, if this is um, safe to treat those patients with high dosage of glucocortic Yeah, so this is an area of interest of mine um, about diabetic CIDP. So, is there an increased rate of, of CIDP in diabetes? I don't, I haven't been able to show that there is. Many experts think that there is an increased rate of um, CIDP in diabetes. We did a controlled study in Olmsted County, Washington, Minnesota, and we did not find an increased rate of diabetes in CIDP. Now, there is an increased rate of inflammatory neuropathies in diabetes. And so, and I think many of these inflammatory neuropathies in diabetes, which I don't think is CIDP, uh, confuses people and they call it diabetic CIDP. That, that, that's my own view of this. There is a motive predominant polyradicular neuropathy that looks a lot like CIDP, but pathologically is not CIDP, and uh, which I call, which is a form in my mind of a diabetic radicular plexus neuropathy. And so I do think it's reasonable to treat them with glucocorticoids. Um, is it safe? Most of these diabetics are type 2 diabetics, so most of them are not brittle diabetics. So I have personally treated 400 patients with diabetes with IV uh, methylprednisolone, and I've had problems in one patient where I put him into the ICU with a very high blood um, sugar, but the rest I have, I have not had problems with. So, you know, that is a whatever, 0.2% problem with doing that. So, so I've gotten away with doing that for years. And I think if you follow them and have them monitor their blood sugars, they do pretty well with that. 400 patients? At least. Uh -huh. And what is the dosage? So again, so I'm, most of these are on monophasic illness. It's, uh, so so it's, not, it's not an ongoing illness. But what I usually will do is one gram IV methylprednisolone three times the first week, such as a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every other day, and then once weekly for 12 weeks, and then stop. And that's also why I like this pulse IV methylprednisolone, is at the end of it, you can just stop it. You don't have to wean them off of it. Professor считает, что все-таки это не ассоциация сахарного диабета и ХВДП. Они лично проводили исследования и не доказали, что у пациентов с сахарным диабетом повышенный риск развития ХВДП, потому что при проведении биопсии это были воспалительные полиневропатии, но морфологически не ХВДП. То есть есть какие-то различные другие воспалительные невропатии, которые часто принимаются за ХВДП, и вот лично профессор считает, что это диабетическая плексоневропатия. Соответственно, лечение гормонами проводится метилпреднизолоном. Лично он пролечил как минимум 400 пациентов. И на его памяти был только один пациент, который попал с высоким уровнем глюкозы крови в реанимацию. Все остальные принесли лечение очень хорошо. Обычно проводится лечение метилпреднизолоном. В острой фазе это где-то 3 грамма в неделю одну неделю, то есть, например, понедельник, среда, пятница, и потом в течение 12 недель по одному грамму в неделю. Особенно хорошо, когда есть возможность проводить пастерапию, это эффективно, и нет таких высоких рисков от приема пероральных глюкортикстроидов. У нас был еще один вопрос, но, наверное, последний будет. Да, расскажите, да, пожалуйста. CIDP is a uh, polyradicular neuropathy, 
So uh, I would like to ask you about your laboratory, uh, EMG laboratory. Uh, there, is there a list of muscles for needle EMG? Uh, do you do needle EMG to any patient who's suspicious of uh, CIDP? Yeah, no. So, so what muscles do we do a needle examination with? We do, we do have protocols uh, in the laboratory, but in general, we don't use them. In other words, we allow the different electromyographers to decide what they think are the appropriate muscles to do a needle examination with. Saying that, I can sort of tell you muscles that I commonly would needle, you know, so we often want to have a mixture of very distal muscles and proximal muscles. So I would do a tibialis anterior, a perineal L5 muscle, I do a medial gastroc, uh, tibial S1. I like the peroneus tertius, which deep perineal L5, it's, it's the most distal muscle without getting into the foot. When you get into the foot, you often get a lot of traumatic changes. I would do a some type of quadricep muscle, often the vastus medialis, but you can do different quadricep muscles. Often do the adductor longus, it's an obturator muscle. And then we often do things like the TFL, uh, uh, which is an L5 uh, muscle. You can also do the gluteus medius, another L5 muscle, gluteus maximus, S1 muscle. And then we'll do different paraspinal muscles, lumbar paraspinal, thoracic paraspinal. Similarly, in the upper limb, first dorsal neurosis, uh, adductor digiti minimi, you can do the APB, um, but that looks a little more painful. You have distal muscles. Um, pronator teres uh, often is a good muscle to do. Biceps, triceps, those are all good muscles. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Last Первый вопрос касается использования ультразвука периферических нервов при ХВДП. Насколько используете ли вы? Насколько вы считаете это информативным? Как вы оцениваете результаты исследования коллег Грим, Кирис Молдис, соответственно, Зайдин? Вот, это первый вопрос. Второй вопрос. Наиболее значимым какое является параклиническое исследование в постановке диагноза из, может быть, лимбальная функция, электронерогография, МРТ заплетение и так далее. То есть наиболее значимым какое исследование. И последний вопрос. Можно ли спрогнозировать какими-то способами развития ну, резистентности к терапии первой линии? То есть, может быть, по сопутствующим каким-то заболеваниям, может быть, еще какие-то есть а, а, критерии, по которым можно спрогнозировать, что пациент не ответит на первую линию. Quickly, three questions. The first is about no ultrasound. Um, do you perform and um, what do you think about the works of your colleagues? Uh, all the um, scales uh, regarding CIDP, UPSS, and so on. Uh, the second question was about uh, which is uh, the most important paraclinical uh, examination in determining CIDP, from your opinion. Um, and the last one question was, uh, can you, pre uh, can you uh, predict that CIDP will be um, refractory? <coughs> well, let's see if I can hold all these questions in my mind. Um, <laughs> I Sorry, I forgot the first question. Uh, nerve ultrasound. Yes, nerve ultrasound. So nerve ultrasound is a very useful tool. Um, and the Mayo Clinic EMG laboratory has uh, three nerve ultrasound machines in the laboratory, and we do a lot of nerve ultrasound there. We're doing it mostly on things like carpal tunnel syndrome. We do it on diaphragmatic studies to see if the diaphragm is working or not. Um, and we do it if we think there's a hypertrophic neuropathy and trying to look at all of that. So yes, I think it is it's quite, now, I didn't quite understand the question about scales. What, what was that? Uh, there are some, some kind of scales for determining demyelination, for instance, MMI and CIDP. Um, it, from ultrasound? Uh -huh. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't have anything to say about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, but I don't, I, I don't use that, so I'm not going to comment on that. I mean, it's not something I do, okay. so. Во-первых, uh, книгам очень полезно исследование. Большое количество у них мое проводится в лаборатории ИМГ. В основном для исследования uh, туннельных синдромов, как Карпали, в том числе для uh, оценки функций диафрагмы. Uh, но шкалами не пользуются. Вот uh, шкалы для оценки демилизации, постановки диагноза Маменко, ВДП и так далее. Шкалы не пользуются. The second one was, well, so you had a question about CIDP and if we could uh, predict CIDP and whether it would be refractory or treatment yeah, responsive. Exactly. And that was the last question, so I'll, that's why I remember it, so I'll answer that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really good question. I, I, I think if it is looks like typical CIDP and, you know, there's uh, conduction blocks and, and that, and it comes on fairly quickly, it's more likely to respond, I think if it is atypical and if there's a lot of secondary axonal loss, it's less likely to respond. If it comes in having seen multiple different neurologists already failed to respond to multiple immunotherapy, then it's not likely to respond, but that's already sort of been tested. Um, for me, professor, не классическая ХВДП, а типичная форма. И кроме этого, если видит uh, выраженную оптимальную дегенерацию, то скорее всего это будет рефрактарный хэнс. И вторая вопрос был о том, что самый важный для клинического экзаменации – это хэнс. Я люблю ЭМГ, ламбопунктуру. Да, да, да. 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 Да, да, да true for everything in neurology, history and exam are, are, are the most important. Second most important, nerve conductions in EMG, and clearly second most important. Third most important, CSF, and this is the third most important. Fourth most important, nerve biopsy, and, and, and depending on, on the case, maybe most, well no, it's always history and exam, maybe second most important, depending on the case, but that is again, for instance, the cis cases, you know, to pr at least conceptually to prove that in fact they were an inflammatory demyelinating disease, one needed to do nerve pathology in some of them. Now, now if I see cysts nowadays, I'm not going to do a rootlet biopsy in most of them. So, you know, maybe that's research at that point. But, but I do think the importance of pathologies in the right circumstances is still very important. Thank you. Uh, clinical prima. Uh, потом идет электронная конечно же, потом лимбальная функция, и на четвертом месте это биопсия, особенно при хронической сенсорной болезни. Я думаю, что мы должны завершать сегодняшнюю конференцию. В первую очередь поблагодарить нашего гостя, профессора Дика, за совершенно замечательную презентацию, за те ответы, развернутые. Вторая мини-лекция, которую он практически прочитал, отвечая на взяли наше любопытство. И это все были очень важные вопросы, практически все в точку. И ответы, на мой взгляд, были столь замечательные. Я хочу сказать, что для всей аудитории нашей, что презентация, которую мы сегодня писали, параллельно будет выложена на сайте научного центра неврологии. В ближайшее время следите, пожалуйста, за нашим сайтом. Там будет на первой странице сообщение об успешно прошедшей лекции. И все смогут познакомиться еще раз осмыслить все, что мы сегодня услышали и увидели, мы надеемся, что мы не последний раз встречаем нашего гостя в наших стенах. Dear Professor Nick, thank you very much for a brilliant presentation, which greatly improved our understanding of the problem of chronic polyneuropathy, of course. And um, you mentioned the importance of family history in polyneuropathies, but yourself, you have a positive family history as a neurologist, because, you, because your famous father is a founder and author of the modern concept of CIDP. It's fantastic, so we really feel the, uh, the air, you know, the, the, uh, the air of uh, classical uh, his, his, history of neurology. Uh, that I, I am sure everybody will remember this lecture for a very long time. And I hope, I strongly believe that we'll find ways how to strengthen our collaboration in the field of education, in the field of conferences, and of course, in some collaborative research studies. Thank you very much for that again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.